This is the Gustard X26 Pro. It's a $1500 standalone DAC, and this unit was loaned to me for review by Aoshida Audio. Thank you very much for sending this over, there is a link to the product page in the description. This is a pretty interesting DAC for a few different reasons. Firstly, it sounds great, I really like how this sounds. Secondly, it measures amazing, I've got full measurements up of this on my website if you'd like to go and see them. In a lot of areas it's one of the best DACs that I've tested, period. And it's doing things internally quite different from a lot of other particularly lower cost DACs. Many lower cost DACs will be an ESS chip, op amps on the output stage, a stock meanwhile power supply and an Exmos USB chip. And even different products from different manufacturers will be basically the same thing, because they're all using literally identical parts. This is using two of the flagship 9038 Pro chips in dual mono. It's got a fully discrete Class A output stage with an analog low pass filter as well. It's got a beefy linear power supply. And the oversampling is being done off the ESS chip on an analog device's DSP chip. And the USB implementation is a proprietary one as well. They've got an ARM CPU and an FPGA, and that's handling it rather than just an Exmos chip. They're doing a lot of stuff in a proprietary fashion in this. And both the objective and subjective performance kind of speaks for itself. This is a really, really good DAC. On the front, you have the power button, a display which is dimmable. And these buttons are some of the best buttons on any product that I've felt. Seriously, there's just so ridiculously tactile and clicky. Love those buttons. You can press the left and right buttons to change the inputs. You can use the up and down ones to adjust the volume. This has a DSP volume control all the way down to minus 90 dB. And if you press the center button, it takes you to the menu. On the menu, you can change the PCM upsampling filter. So I've left it on Vivid for most of my listening. That's the stock filter. It's also the one that I felt sounds the best. DSD cutoff filter. Reference clock. You can either have external 10 megahertz or internal. Internal is obviously using the clock inside the DAC, but it has an external 10 megahertz connector. So if you have a Mutec clock or something, or if you're using this in a studio setting, you can use an external clock. That's a nice feature to have. I've not actually tried that. I don't know how it improves things or changes sound, but it's a nice feature to have nonetheless. NOS mode. That's not actually NOS. It's kind of annoying when DAC manufacturers call something NOS and it's not actually NOS. You can't run NOS on a Delta Sigma DAC. You have to have R2R. It, it, it's not possible on a Delta Sigma DAC. This is what the impulse response of the NOS mode on this looks like. It's basically just a very, very short minimum phase filter. So just treat that as another filter option, basically. You can invert the phase, and then the brightness of the display can be adjusted there. Let's have a look at the back. On the rear, we have the IC input and an easy access fuse there. Two voltage switches, so you can change it depending on your region. You don't have to get a region-specific unit, but make sure that you check these switches are correct. Optical input, AES. Coax, I squared S, USB, which is sideways for some reason, don't know why that is, Bluetooth antenna, and a 10 megahertz clock input. So that's not actually a signal input, that's just for an external clock. Analog outputs we have balanced and single ended. Let's have a look inside. The internals of the X26 Pro kind of leave you wanting for nothing, really. Two massive transformers here, fully separated and shielded from the rest of the DAC via that piece of metal. Lots of capacitance and power filtering going on down here. Voltage regulators for anything that might need it. No corners have been cut. This is a really nice and well thought through and very thorough design with a lot of stuff that wouldn't normally be present in DACs even more expensive than this. This is the K2 clock synthesizer. Now it is a clock in itself, but it's also got a bit more of a complex job, because it needs to generate a signal which is a multiple of either 44.1 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz from the 10 megahertz input. You can't just run a 44.1 kilohertz DAC off 10 megahertz, because 10 megahertz doesn't divide by 44.1. So that basically has to synthesize a new clock signal from the 10 megahertz input. If we turn it this way, you can actually see the digital signal processing board a little bit clearer. Now up here, there is an ARM microprocessor. That's doing the job of the USB receiver. So that's handling the USB implementation. There is a Shark DSP chip here. That's doing the oversampling, upsampling. There is an Exmos chip, which is normally what would be doing the USB receiver circuitry, but that's actually just there to do the MQA unfolding, because this is an MQA capable DAC. MQA runs on Exmos, so that's actually why that's there. It's not doing anything with the USB itself. There is an Altera Max 2 FPGA. I'm guessing that that's just to do the actual control function of the DAC. When you're browsing the menu and changing settings and all stops, that, that's basically the brains of the system. This board alone probably cost quite a bit. Clearly, Gustard has not cut any corners. They've thought stuff through. This is a really nice design. There are two heat sinks on the 9038 chips, because those, especially when they're running in current mode, get really, really hot. 
a lot of DAC manufacturers do not run them in current mode because you can actually get slightly better um, THD plus N or Synad if you run them in voltage mode, but you get an IMD hump. If you run them in current mode, you get slightly worse THD plus N normally, but you get no IND hump. But they also run hotter. Gustard's kind of solved both problems. I'm guessing they're running them in current mode because they've got big heat sinks on them. They don't have an IMD hump on this DAC, and the Synad is amazing. So they're doing a good job with whatever they've configured it as here. No op amps. This is a fully discrete, fully class A output stage, and it's got an analog low pass filter as well, which is intended to cut off and eliminate any kind of ultrasonic noise. This is a really nice design. There's not really much you can complain about. Everything looks fantastic. Yeah, well done, Gustard. This is a really difficult DAC to review in terms of value. And I like how it sounds, but the value proposition is an odd one. This is $1,500. And at $1,500, there's not many other products to compare it to. There's not many standalone DACs between $1,000 and $2,000. There's this. There's the called Cutest, which this is better than a Cutest in my opinion, just outright. The most direct competitor is probably the Denifrips Pontus, but I'm going to guess that the Pontus, which I've not heard, this is just a guess, th that's probably just going to be different, not better or worse. And the reason I say that is the Gustard X26 Pro sounds like an upgraded, refined SMSL D1SE. The D1SC and the Ares 2 from Denifrips are my two favourite sub $1,000 DACs. I love them both, they're both great, but they're good at different things, and I can't pick a winner between the two, they are just different. And so if this sounds like an upgraded D1SE, and the Pontus sounds like an upgraded Ares 2, that's probably going to be just a case of being different, not better or worse again. And so then there's not much left to compare this to at its price point. All you can really compare it to is the sub $1,000 stuff, which this is better than any of the sub $1,000 DACs that I've tried. It's better than a D1SE, an Ares 2, a D90, D90SE, an ADI2, whatever. But it's also not as good as some of the above $2,000 DACs, like a Hollow Spring 3. The D1SE, which sounds most similar to this, th this is better than a D1SE, but it's not a huge jump. It's $700 more, and so if you're happy to pay $700 more from a D1SE to this, would you also be happy to pay $700 more from this to get a Hollow Spring 3, which is better again? It's a weird, difficult to compare value proposition, and so I'm not going to talk about it further, I just wanted to explain that. It's a really, really good deck. But there's not much that I can say in terms of, is it worth the money? Because $1,500 is a very empty market segment. Let's talk a little bit about how it sounds. Overall, this is a very detail-oriented DAC. It's massively resolving, makes background information really quite apparent. It's very incisive, but it's not sharp or clinical. In fact, one of the reasons I like it so much is that it's quite a bit smoother and better for longer listening sessions than some of the lower cost stuff, like the D1SE or the D90. One of the issues that you fall into sometimes with the lower cost stuff, like, uh, okay, the Ares 2 and the D1SE, as I mentioned, those are my two favorite under $1,000 decks. The D1SE is much more resolving. The D1SE has slightly bigger sounding stage, and it's got better macrodynamics and impact and crack. But the Ares 2 has better layering and spatial positioning, even though the stage is a little bit smaller. It's warmer, but it's not quite as resolving. They're two quite different presentations. They're both really good for different genres and different situations. I can't, I can't pick a winner between the two. This doesn't have that just slight sharpness that the D1SE sometimes has. It, it smooths that off, but it's more resolving. It's got better layering. It's got better low-end texture. It, it's just a slightly better DAC. It's giving you kind of the best of both worlds. This DAC is doing a lot right. The overall control that the sound signature exhibits is really, really good. It never feels like it's struggling or trying too hard. It's not sharp, it's not soft. Proper low-end sub-bass rumble, snap, impact, weight, and texture is fantastic, all the way through up into upper treble air. Everything there, just in terms of detail, both macro and microdynamic, is really, really good on this DAC. Soundstage is good, but not necessarily better than like a D1SE, so it's not an improvement, but it's not worse. The one thing which this DAC doesn't handle super well is timbre, where it does come across just a little bit dry. It's not sharp or etchy or anything, it's just, it could use a little bit more body, but other than that, just about everything that this DAC is doing is really, really good. I have found that the DAC improves slightly from a good DDC, which is why I'm using the KTE SU2 at the moment. The USB implementation is clearly very good, because the JIT is very low and it sounds fantastic, uh, but it does sound slightly better with the DDC, so that's what I'm using at the moment.
So let's play a track which shows off how well the X26 Pro does micro detail and the, the little things in the track, almost background information quite a lot of the time. This is Cola by Arlo Parks, and throughout most of this track, there's a ride symbol being struck. It's audible, obviously, on a lot of decks, but the decay can be a little bit more prominent, the initial strike can sometimes be less defined, and as the vocals and other stuff in the track are happening, it gets harder to hear, it gets a little bit masked. Whereas here, on the X26 Pro, it's just its own thing occupying its own space, and it's crystal clear the whole time. It's a little bit easier to hear um, at that point in the track, so I'm actually going to jump to about a minute and 30 seconds in. I'll miss your t-shirt in the rain, the one that makes you look like Jared Wayne Grapes. Even as the vocals are going, it's still crystal clear and doesn't feel bothered or masked at all. Whereas on a lot of even otherwise very good decks like the D1SE, it's just a little bit washed over almost. Here, that's not happening. This deck likes to put space between musical elements. It likes to separate things, but whilst the Chord Cutest did that to a pretty large extent as well, the cutest felt artificial when it was doing it, because it only really did it in a 2D sort of sense. Separation and ease of listening to just one thing was great, but there was not enough depth to actually pull it off, and it ended up sounding like it was just doing it on a left-to-right plane in front of you, or through your head even. This, it's got the stage, it's got the space and air to pull that off, and so when you listen to something like this, which is Like a Kennedy by Joywave, where you've got a lot of stuff with a lot of spatial cues going on, it presents them in a very 3D sense. But that then sort of electric guitar strum at the very end there, you can hear that that was recorded in a very different manner, or processed in a very different manner. Because that particular element sounds flat, but nothing else does. You can almost hear that that's like positioned closer to you than some of the other elements in the mix. So the spatial presentation of this is really, really good. I love the sense of air that this gives, I love the sense of space that this gives, and the combination of space and separation makes music like this work. Perhaps one of the best tracks to illustrate this kind of effect is Hideaway by Jacob Collier. I'm not even going to say anything more about it, I'm just going to play this bit. Jacob Collier is one of those people who you watch the stuff that he does, because he does a lot of like talks and things on YouTube, he's, I think he's done TED Talks and things, and the stuff that he can explain or come up with on the spot and just, just do at a moment's notice is... Uh, it, it makes you wonder how some people have so much talent and the rest of us are so goddamn normal. It, he's brilliant, he's got some really interesting stuff available if you want to go watch it. What about less audiophile music then? What about if you're listening to just metal or rock or something? This is T-Shirt by Nash, and this is a much heavier, denser sounding track, but again it shows off just how resolving and universal this DAC can be. It's not genre dependent. The ability to separate and pull things out without sounding artificial kind of goes as far as the track will allow it. It's not something where you have to listen to classical, and it doesn't work with rock, or the other way around. It, it, It'll work with anything you throw at it. In my closet, I can't cause I still got your t-shirt. Do you want it back? I gave you love and all you did was leave first. Then you told me that I shouldn't be hurt. I try to have It keeps things sounding smooth, but with so much detail. There's no sharpness here, whereas it can on this track on some decks. But then some decks smooth things over and it ends up sounding just a little bit too blended together. Whereas here, everything's picked out, everything's fully resolved. The control and definition to the low end as well is fantastic. It's just doing a great job of handling everything that's going on in this track.
This is a really resolving deck without the flaws that come with a lot of other, particularly lower cost, resolving decks. Too many decks are resolving, but then don't know how to make things sound natural at all. You kind of have to pick one of the two. You either have to pick smooth and warm and natural, but not that much resolution, or lots and lots of resolution, but clinical, sharp and analytical. This is a really, really nice middle of the road. It's giving you silly amounts of resolution, lovely amounts of separation, huge amounts of control of the low end, but it's not sharp. It's really smooth and you can just listen to it for hours. Soundstage on the X26 Pro is okay. It's not really an upgrade from like a D1SE or something. It's kind of in the same ballpark as some of the cheaper decks. It's not as good as some higher end decks, but it, it's not worse than a D1SE or something. It, it, it's about the same. So would have been nice to get a slight upgrade there, but it's still doing a good job. This is Ezio's family from the Grassini Project. Grassini Project do some really, really nice recordings uh, and classical renditions of video game soundtracks. So this is one from Assassin's Creed and their recordings are fantastic. So stage is good, it could be bigger. I have heard this track rendered bigger on something, I don't know, like a Spring 3 or a Dave or whatever, but it's it's fine. It's not bad, it just, I would have liked it to be a little bit better considering the price difference. What is nice about the stage though is the fact that it does manage to layer within it quite a bit better. The separation capabilities are not just two dimensional. It is definitely a three dimensional sense. You don't get the same level of authoritative, almost tactility, as you do with seemingly most R2R decks. The Ares 2, which is much lower cost, nowhere near as resolving as this, but it does position things with a more convincing nature. This is doing a really good job for a Delta Sigma deck though. That seems to be one of the main characteristics that I find is different between Delta Sigma and R2R. In, in terms of Delta Sigma decks, it's doing a great job there. I've mentioned it a little bit in this video already, but base on this deck is something which is just rendered with this real sense of grip control and definition is the best word that I can put to it. The low end elements themselves have a huge amount of resolution. They are fast and snappy when they need to be, forceful and weighty when they need to be, and they don't bother anything else either. The separation effect continues all the way down into deep sub bass, because where some decks, like the Ares 2, which I really enjoyed, but one of its flaws is that when there is a lot of low end elements happening in the track, Stuff higher up starts getting a little bit masked and congested, a little bit harder to hear. That's not happening here at all. The low end elements themselves, it never feels like it's struggling or can't quite do something. Some decks might be very sort of textured and warm and forceful sounding, but can't be quick and nimble when they need to be and fast and impactful. Some decks have the opposite where they are massively snappy and quick, but there's no real body or weight to the sound. Whereas this is doing all of it. It's doing all of it really, really well. Bonafide by Emotional Oranges is a pretty good show and tell track for this. This has got quite a lot of low end elements going on, which need both quick immediacy and force and the decay of bass guitar, all whilst there's some vocals and spatial cues going on, which just don't get touched at all. It's fast and punchy, and then the decay and texture of that bass guitar is wonderful and inviting. All the while, the I'm not actually sure what kind of instrument that is, or if it's a synth, um, going off in the distance just feels completely separate. It doesn't feel like it's... Yeah, the bass guitar is right slap bang in the middle. It's not touching anything else. Everything is really, really distinct, resolved, and separate. Are you okay, sleeping through the silence? Space and time allow us to become whole again. We deserve to ch The spatial cues on the vocals are fantastic as well. It's not as expansive as some other decks, but the fact that the low end just feels so controlled is really, really inviting and engaging for a lot of electronic and kind of funk type music as well. Let's see if we can find something a little bit punchier from Emotional Oranges. They've got a lot of good tracks. Let's do Personal, if they have it. Here we go. Tonight, I 
it just sounds brilliant. I, I don't really need to tell every single thing about it. It, it sounds fantastic. It's one of actually the best acts that I've heard this particular track on. So I've been singing its praises a lot. Why am I not just giving it a full, flat out recommendation? Well, it's because it's got one thing which it doesn't do so well, and that's timbre. The resolution's there, the space is there, the separation's there, the low end is fantastic, but timbre of instruments and vocals is just a little bit on the dry side. If it didn't have that, this would be a really, really fantastic deck, but that's its one fatal flaw at the moment. So let's do, what have I got on the playlist? The Night King, okay. So this is from uh, Game of Thrones, and the best way to describe it is it sounds just a little bit too papery. Not etchy, but just a little bit too lightweight, just a little bit too airy. There's not quite enough almost lower mid-range upper bass body to the sound. If it just had a little bit more of that, then this would be nigh on perfect, but it's just a bit too dry. And it's a real shame, because you can hear there's so much information going on here, and the separation and scale of it's great, but then it's just not quite making you feel like it's real. It feels like it's trying to tell you information, rather than trying to let you be immersed in the music itself. It, it feels artificial because of that reason alone. Everything else about this deck is really, really good. It's so resolving. The space, okay, soundstage could be a little bit better, but it's not bad. The separation's so good. The clarity and, and black ground is so good. The low end is so good. It's just, it just needs slightly better timbre. If it wasn't just that little bit too much on the dry side, this would be really, really special. And so when you're listening to a piece of music like this, on a slightly less resolving deck, perhaps slightly less technically capable in many areas deck, that is just a little bit more close to reality in terms of timbre, you can just kind of get lost in it. Whereas when you've got a deck which has so much information and so much resolution, but isn't quite sounding as those instruments should actually sound in terms of their timbre, it's just not quite there. And it just leaves you feeling a little bit neutral on it. It's not bad, but you know that there's more to be had. And so that leaves me in the situation where I do recommend this deck. I think this is a fantastic sounding deck, in, and it's doing so much right. But if you're the kind of person who listens to a lot of orchestral or other music where timbre of instruments is critical to you, give it a miss. But for anyone else, anyone who's either just a detail freak and doesn't really mind too much about timbre, which is some people, some people just want the sheer resolution and clarity that this thing can offer, or if you listen to pop, electronic, rock, just about anything that isn't orchestral, this is great. So that's where I'm going to leave it. This is a fantastic deck, and it's doing so much right, so much either really, really well or absolutely fantastic. The one thing that it could be doing better is timbre. Timbre is a little bit dry, but everything else is brilliant. And the X26 Pro has a high recommendation from me. If you'd like to talk to me or any other Wiggly Air enthusiasts, then join the Discord server at the link in the description, or support me on Patreon or Subscribestar and get access to the private Telegram chat. Thank you so much to every single one of you who is supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar. You guys are fantastic. Especially my crazy Summit 5 people, Chief Big Time, Erroneous, Dan Mellinger, Fake Aussie Accent, Joe, King Jung Un, Commodus, Ross Kyle, and Disaraster. My Legend Tier supporters, Chandler Bassett, Chris, CK Yozizawa Zoo, Jidan the Sheba and Gravitas, and my Diamond supporters, Adam Cardos, Bean Boawito, Beefy Fish, Bob Butler, Not Twist, Clockmeister, Desert Scrub, Dwayne Butler, Gizmo 1K, Grant Evans, Jean R, Luxifer, Nino, and Pokey. Thank you guys so much, you make this all happen.